Hello, everyone. I'm Anthony Borders. I'm editor and event content manager for the North Bay Business Journal, and I'm here to welcome you today to our inaugural um, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Conference here at the Journal. We're pleased to be able to present this important topic. Uh, we all know the tragedy of George Floyd's murder, which was sadly followed by others, and it, it propelled this nation to into protests, making this an issue that could no longer be ignored. But according to Forbes, as far back as 2015, there was a study published on why diversity matters. It pointed out that companies that paid attention to diversity and inclusion did better financially when they reflected the community that they served. Taking a deeper dive just three years later, researchers put a number to those gains. Diversity inclusion companies and that paid attention to that had 43% higher profits. The question today is really, has the message been heard? Companies are investing more in training and responding to the public demand for such. But to their, and, to the, and they're also responding to the undercurrent of their own workers who report continuing bias. CEOs and boardrooms are being watched. Are they in it for the long haul? Are they making concrete changes in pay and workplace environments? Or are they just performing, as one person called it, diversity theater? Journal, the journal believes that we have assembled some people here today who will have some real insights into how we're doing on this challenging issue and what, frankly, we can do better. We will hear from, an, from the Asian American perspective. It's not only been dealing with the issues that uh, others have been dealing with, but it's been touched about not only by hot, hateful rhetoric, but physical violence recently. We will touch on building the lasting bridges into the Latino community, as well as the, uh, hear from a passionate nonprofit CEO, someone who recognized that change is necessary and it has to come from inside an organization to have meaningful progress. Finally, we will hope to open some eyes personally about how we all operate under some sort of bias, perhaps unaware that we do so. But before we hear from our experts, we want to thank the companies who have helped bring this program to you today. Kaiser Permanente is supporting this discussion of the, this important topic as a major sponsor. And please also join me in thanking our corporate sponsor today, the Trope Group. If you would like or need to use closed captioning services during this event, please click on the transcript icon at the bottom of the screen, then click hide the subtitles. So let's get started today. We are honored to have with us today, John, Dr. Jason Lau, Interim Associate Dean and Senior International Officer with Sonoma State University. Dr. Lau is the holder of citizenships in Hong Kong, the European Union, and the United States. He traveled from his native Hong Kong to Iowa and became the first member of his family to receive a college degree. Beyond education, he's worked on campus at SSU and other campuses to highlight the contributions of Asian Americans to the community and to raise awareness. For, for him, this is a particularly important time to pursue this passion. For as I mentioned, as we've all heard, there have been ugly and troubling news stories about violent attacks on Asian American in our communities. Today, we look forward to hearing from Dr. Lau and the work to be done to build stronger bonds in the Asian American community in the North Bay. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Lau. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, such an honor to be here today. And I want to, first of all, thank you, the North Bay Business Journal, for hosting this very important conference. Um, and I'm glad to be here today. I'm going to go ahead and share my slide here. Today, I, I'm going to share more of a personal perspective, where I, where I became and how I, my experience in the United States uh, as a new immigrant uh, and also educator. Um, to me, diversity is, is, is beautiful things. Um, and that's one of the reasons I'm here today. Uh, I want to touch on a, share a, a short story and then um, kind of touch on a little bit about who, who are Asian Americans 
and some of the lessons learned uh, that I want to personally share with the audience. First of all, with the story, I want to share with you a, a quick story, a true story of an international student who came to the United States from Hong Kong a little bit over 20 years ago. He came from a small family of four and with a brother with mental and physical disabilities. In Hong Kong, he struggled academically and during high school, he failed his university, university entrance exam and has no choice but to repeat the fifth year of his high school and he, otherwise he will have no path to further his studies. One day, he and a visiting professor from Iowa met on a street in Hong Kong. They have never met before and didn't know each other. But after he, he knowing his story, the professor invited him to the University of Northern Iowa and offered him a full scholarship to study there. The professor also offered him a job in his department so that he can earn some money to help pay for his living expenses. Unfortunately, his father passed away from cancer the same year at age 58. But with the courage of the professor and his mother, he left Hong Kong to attend UNI the following year. He had no money and also just brought him with two suitcases. With the support from the professor and the faculty and staff and students alike, he overcame the language and cultural barrier and the academic challenges to graduate at the top of his class. He also became the first member of his family to receive a college degree. The university sponsored him with an H-1B working visa so that he can stay and give back to the Whaley University that supported him and his education. He continued to pursue his education and eventually earned his PhD in higher education policy and leadership study from the University of Iowa. Today, he's the interim associate dean and senior international officer at Sonoma State University, one of the California State University's campuses. He's also an adjunct instructor at Santa Rosa Junior College and serve as a board chair with the YMCA of San Francisco in the Marine uh, Branch, and also the commission, commissioner and chair of the Marine County Child Care Commission. I know this person well, because that international student was me. On June 7, 2017, I passed my very last exam, the US citizenship exam, and was among 12, 131 people from 91 different countries to take my oath to the United States and became a US citizen. And this is the American dream. And this is an amazing story, Jenny. That isn't really about me or anything that about special about me, but it's this country, this nation, who provide the opportunity for, for everyone, regardless where they're coming from, where they came from and their background and to make the impossible possible. And so this is the story that I would like to share and it's my experience uh, based on um, my last 20 years here in the United States. And you can see here, it's me and my wife you know, with, with our um, oak, um, sawing ceremony in Oakland, California. And this, this is something that I, I, I don't think any other country can can have you know can be possible except here in the United States, which I'm very proud of and to share. So with that, what are the three lessons that I learned during my time here as an educator and my background in nonprofit? I know the audience, most of the audience may be coming from the business community. And, and I hope that you share my background with nonprofit and also in higher education. And hopefully this experience can trans, uh, transform into um, you know, work that practical and useful in, in your workplace. So here's the three things I would like to talk about. Number one is to unlearn and relearn. Number two is at the table. And number three is a zero sum game. So I'm going ahead to elaborate a little bit more. So lesson one, to unlearn and relearn. We all have our own perceptions and misperceptions you know, of certain things. Uh, in this particular case, I want to focus on the Asian American community. Myself included, coming from, Hong, coming from Hong Kong 20 years ago, 
we learn lots of things about, or not le didn't learn lots of things about diversity. Um, in fact, there's discrimination even among the Chinese community. You know, regardless of our skin color, we are Chinese, we are Asians, but there's discrimination. We're discriminated about, uh, to, of, of all the people who, who, who moved to Ch from China to Hong Kong because of the different, you know, econ socioeconomical background, the, 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 you know, our accents, you know, and our education level, our income level. So it's not just about the skin color, but you can discriminate people based on, you know, their, their class, you know, and, you know, their socioeconomical background. Um, the Asian American community is very diverse. Um, and you might have heard of the terms APA, Asian Pacific Americans, API, Asian Pacific Islander, or the AAPI, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. These are the terms that you used in the United States to include both Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders Americans. However, the, the, the term is really broad and really um, uh, uh, complex. And if you can see, this is a chart put together by a professor from CSU East Bay. And to show the different origin and, and uh, the different group of Asians, and also including Middle, Middle Eastern and the Pacific Islanders. And you can see this is, you can, you can categorize it, you know, and, and slice it and slice it in all the different way. Um, but it's really complex, different group. And for example, just myself, Chinese uh, from Hong Kong, this, the language, the spoken language we speak in Hong Kong is Cantonese. But in mainland China and Taiwan, for example, we speak Mandarin. But the written language, we use traditional characters. And in China, they use simplified characters. So you cannot generalize just by looking at the person and even knowing it's Chinese and assume they, come, they have the same background, they, they, they use the same language, and even you know, they use the same written uh, language as well. So today, I'm more focusing on the Asian Americans. Um, and I want to share a few facts. Asian America is the, was one of the fastest growing major racial and ethnic group in the United States. There's more than 20 million Asian live in the US and almost they all trace back to at least 19 different countries in the East and Southeast Asia and the Indian uh, subcontinent. So as you can see that on this chart, um, about 85% of the Asian population that made up of these six major uh, ethnic groups including the Chinese, the Indian, Filipino, Vietnamese, Koreans, and Japanese. And why the Asian American groups is, is significant? I, I think uh, Anthony mentions um, about the possibility of, from a, from a business perspective, um, you know, in terms of economic developments and, you know, the spanning of different Asian American, you know, group. Uh, in this case, the Asian American, uh, has doubled um, the, the, um, the population between uh, 2000, 2000 and 2019 and projects to, to suppress 46 million by 2020. So it is a, 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 a increasing population and there's a lot of opportunity out there that for, to serve this very, very important community. What about here in the, in the Bay Area? So we look at just the, in Marin and Sonoma and Napa County, um, we are at 6.6% the Asian American, Asian alone, the percentage just, just focus on the Asian, just a single ethnic group. Um, Sonoma County is about 4.6%, Napa County is 8.9%. And of course, compared to our, our neighbor, uh, San Francisco County, which has 36% of Asian American population, we are, we have a really small uh, percentage. But overall, compared to um, you know, the US, which is about 5.9, we, we still have more, a little bit more, um, you know, the Asian American population here in these three North Bay counties. Um, so, so we know the, the Asian American population is, is rising, it's increasing. And what are some of the opportunity and possibility that we can, as the workforce, to 
to invite, you know, to hire, you know, Asian American and or serve our Asian American customers. Um, one thing that we can do, you know, as a, as a business community is at the table. I always believe that if you're not, you might have heard that if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. Uh, I like it's better to say, you know, if you're not at the table, you're on the table. So what exactly that mean? Um, I, I feel like, you know, as a, as a community members, we have an important um, uh, responsibility to represent. Uh, as a company, as a business community, we want to support our worker and ourselves included, the management, to participate, be an active participant in the community. Uh, here's some of the opportunity and I've taken advantage of. Uh, and the, the chamber, for example, is, is a really good source uh, that provide those opportunity. Uh, myself, personally, I participate in the San Rafael Leadership uh, and the Nevada Chamber that has the Nevada Leadership Programs. Those are great opportunity uh, for our employee or our um, uh, owners of any businesses to network and engage um, because that's the way, that's the best way to actually learn about um, your, your local community, your local government inside out. Um, I participate in the YMCA program, serve on the board here in Marin, uh, as well as participate in the, in the Rotary Club. And those are wonderful opportunity. Uh, again, you know, not only for us to engage the community, but also for the community to get to know us. Um, so these are some of the examples. Um, I'm very proud, for example, here, the Marin YMCA, uh, to actually bring our culture uh, to Marin, even though we have a smaller, compared to our neighbor in San Francisco, a smaller Asian American community. Uh, but that doesn't make us any less important. Um, we reach out and we actually, you know, this is actually a picture taken as at the Asian Heritage uh, Month in May, that we actually bring our uh, diverse Asian community and alliance uh, to the Marin YMCA uh, to celebrate this very important uh, month. Um, we have the, the supported for the Marine Chinese Cultural Association, uh, the Bay Area Discovery Museum with the Nuna New Year celebration usually happen in late February. Uh, we also have, as you can see, the Taiko group actually from Sonoma County uh, that have a uh, first Asian Pacific Games baseball game in, in Marin. Uh, I'm also part of the Friends of China game, Cam in Marin promoting and trying to understand the, uh, the rich historical and cultural uh, uh, resources here in the state park, in the China Camp State Park. Another opportunity that I personally have is um, with the higher education community. And I'm sure that that's equivalent of business community like the chambers or our organization of your business that you and your employee can participate. Here's an example that I participate in the Asian Pacific American in higher education. This is a group that form actually uh, our president, uh, Julie Sakaki at Sonoma State, as well as uh, President Fran Chong at the Santa Rosa Junior College are both the founding mem member of this organization. Uh, we have a conference every year and allow our Asian uh, API community to get together to discuss and learn about and how to better uh, promote our services uh, to our students and to our faculty and staff. Really the idea is to build bridges and to connecting the different generations and our community. Um, we also provide Asian scholarship um, to our um, Asian populations uh, serving Marin, Napa and Sonoma County for the Asian scholarship fund. Um, and he is, you can see a president from Sonoma State um, that she's actually uh, the first Japanese Americans to serve a four year university in the United States. So we really are very proud of our North Bay community we have actually two Asian American presidents here served in the education arena. The, the last lesson here myself is, is, is it a zero sum game you know, of diversity and inclusion? And maybe not. I think we should focus more on the whole is actually greater than the sum of the parts. Um, and I think that's the beauty of diversity. And inclusion really means that everyone in the diverse mix feel involved, value, respect, treated fairly, and embedded in your culture. 
So we are allowed to express ourselves. We feel this, we feel respected, excuse me, respected in our community and valued it. Um, and your business and your community can actually benefit from all the different groups that actually make your business stronger and make you better equipped to serve your customer. But you have to first empower all your employee and your organization to recognize these talents. So this is part of a creating a very really inclusive company. So to generate a positive outcome that Anthony actually mentioned earlier. My research on, on empowerment is actually study on organizational trust and support. And to me, this is one of the things that I believe in very strongly, that in order for this outcome to happen, um, you have to provide support and really make your, make your employee and your business community that feel trusted, that, that they can count on you because part of being empowered, part of taking that action is a rich, risk-taking uh, activities. They have to feel comfortable, they have to feel safe and support in order for that to happen. So it's very important that your company is having those policy and support your employee so that they can feel trusted and support to actually be able to be an active participant and then be more engaged. The County of Marine, for example, have these affinity different groups. Maple is one of the Asian American public local employee group in Marine County that we are really actively partner with. And these are wonderful groups that actually in your local community, you can seek out to, you can consult with, uh, to work with them, to, to help them help to bring knowledge and, and maybe provide training uh, to your business community or reach out to them to see what activities that are going on that you can actually be part of. Here's in Sonoma State, uh, we have a new Office of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion. Um, and these are the different faculty and staff association group that um, we have that to also support. I'm part of the Asian Pacific Islanders, American Faculty and Staff Association. That really made me feel included and we respect it. Uh, we have a lot of activities that, that we form to support our student populations and our faculty. So this is something that, again, your organization can provide. So as a number state, uh, what we do in our work is for the advisory com council, com com uh, community initiative and task force. Um, I'm not saying that you have to do exactly all this, but again, some of the things that, that depending on the size of, of, of your organization, that you can provide uh, and this group to generate some initiative. Can you, for example, during the Lunar New Year, the, the Chinese New Year activities, can you partner with other nonprofit or your local Asian American community to provide some event or during the May Asian Heritage Month, you know, can you do some event to support your local Asian community to make that them feel welcome and supported? And last, I want to leave you with this um, that I, you know, from our commission in the Child Care Council, he said, we believe that equity, you know, when successful, does not take resources from one person to give to the, to give it, to give to another. And that's what I was suggesting that is don't look at diversity as a zero sum game that you have to take something away from one person and give it to the other. I think United States and this nation is rich enough, is large enough that we can all successful. Uh, we can provide the opportunity, just like doesn't matter their citizen or non citizen, and people like me who has no mean that have this wonderful opportunity to come here to study and give back to this society uh, so that we can all reach to our full potential. Uh, and when we have a just and fair inclusion in the county or in, you know, in your business environment so that all can participate, prosper and reach to their full potential. Um, and that I think will really help um, to, our, to help our, our business community and, and, and your, your employee uh, uh, to be successful. So again, I wanna thank you um, for inviting me today uh, to share my perspective and I hope my story, um, which is, I don't think is unique in some, in any way, uh, but it's just one of the many story of, of immigrants, of, um, of Asian Americans in this country that I hope can share and provide at least some inspirations and some idea about what we can do together um, 
in order to promote diversity and inclusion uh, in the Bay Area here. And again, thank you very much. And um, I look forward to any other, any questions in Q&A. Thank you, Dr. Lau. We uh, so appreciate your uh, comments. I think the uh, final point of the diversity, equity, and inclusion for a company or a business community is not a game of subtraction, but one of addition. Uh, that's a very good point, and I appreciate your making that. Uh, your story is very inspiring, uh, your personal story, so I think I'll take us back a little bit and ask a question about that, and then maybe quickly move us forward. So you're a young person coming to the United States into the middle of uh, the United States and attending college. Um, describe what was your first impression of landing in Iowa to attend college? Well, I would say it's cold. Um, <laughs> I, I still remember that's January 6, 1997. I never, I never forget that day. I landed in a very small airport in Wautula, Iowa. Uh, it was flat, it was white, uh, I mean, the snow I'm talking about. And of course, you know, the, 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 the population is in Iowa is majority white. But I, I find it, the, the Iowa is very welcoming. Um, and, and I, you know, I have great experience, you know, in my 15 years of experience studying and working in the state of Iowa and for the university there. Um, and and I, I, if I have to choose again, I would definitely do it again. But now that in California, uh, I think my family will rather stay here in this beautiful Bay Area in the wine country, for sure. I can certainly understand that. Uh, and now let's just go to the uh, present day, if I could. And the, as I mentioned in the introduction, there's been troubling reports of Asian American violence on Asian Americans, uh, some very close to us. And I wanted to see if there, and that's triggered a response, some of it positive with messaging out in the media about uh, this problem to try to open and shed a light on it. Do you see um, potential for this being um, kind of a, a seminal moment where we might learn something and improve as a society, even though it's a terrible thing to have to go through? I, 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 I do think so, that I, I think any, any, any incident, any situation like this um, can be a really good learning opportunity uh, for folks to engage. I think if you ask the Asian American community, and I've heard from, from many of the generation here, um, from the older generation here who live in Marin here uh, much longer than I do, they, all, they will tell you this incident is not new. Uh, mm -hmm. The Asian Americans, you know, experience similar and, and these, these, these uh, incidents uh, a long time, you know, and this going on, you know, forever. But, um, but now because of the media and social media uh, coverage, they just become more, more apparent that they bring it to the surface. And I, and I hope that at the same time, because of the social media and, and, and the media coverage, um, that will also encourage more, more Asian Americans um, to actually participate and, and, and speak up and, 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 and speak, uh, stand up and speak up. Uh, I know in Marin, for example, we uh, stage a, um, I would not call it a protest, but a demonstration in San Rafael, the Asian American Alliance organizing events. Uh, really to show, you know, that we care about this community, you know, but at the same time, in order for us to, to, to live here and be a product, productive members, we have to feel safe. And those are essential in order for us to, to be able to function. And, and it's really sad to, to hear, especially the older um, um, uh, population, the older elders, you know, in the community sometime after the, the victim of this attack. But uh, we hope that by coming together, uh, we're stronger together, that will help to address some of this issue. And, and I think I think for the most part, you know, our community again are, are doing, are responding and, and um, you know, and, and really trying to do uh, the best we can to support our, our, our Asian American community um, here in, in, in the Bay Area. Thank you so much, Dr. Lau, for that insight. Let's hope you're right. Uh, I appreciate your personal story and your uh, being willing to join us here today. Thank you so much. Thank you. And now please join me in saying good morning to our next speaker, Anita Maldonado. She is CEO for Social Advocates for Youth, or SAY. And that organization has been so active in supporting young people and families in our community. 
As for Anita, she's prominent in, uh, in that area, having drawn from a background and holding a PhD in higher education administration from Kent State University, where she also taught Latino studies in the Pan-African department. But academics aside, the reason Anita joins us here today, it's her passion. It's her passion in changing the dialogue around diversity, equity, and inclusion in an organization. And she knows what she's talking about because she started with her own organization. She can speak to what she's done to improve uh, the discussion in her own organization. What did she learn from it? What can we all learn from it? And that's why we are so happy today that Anita agreed to join us and tell her story. So let's welcome her. Welcome, Anita. Thank you, Anthony. It's an honor and privilege to be here. I want to thank North Bay Business Journal for shining a spotlight on this very important issue. And thank, thank you to Dr. Lau for sharing his very powerful presentation. I'm going to begin by sharing my screen here. And I'd like to preface um, this presentation by stating that I am not an expert in the area of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, along with many people who decided to take the journey after the murder of George Floyd, uh, myself and um, Social Advocates for Youth, the organization where I serve as the chief executive officer, we too decided to make a commitment to uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And my commitment, my personal commitment to this work is to use my influence and privilege in my role to push the agenda of diversity, equity, and inclusion forward for the betterment of the organization. So um, I want to talk a little bit about who we are, and then I'll talk a little bit about what we've done over the past um, year or year and a half. So for 50 years, we have successfully provided research and evidence-based services designed to promote the well-being and self-sufficiency for vulnerable young people in our community. And we do this through the expression of our mission, our vision, and our core values. Since 1971, we've served over 60,000 children, youth, and family members. SAY is a recognized leader in serving disconnected and at-risk youth in Sonoma County. And our work is really founded on four pillars, crisis counseling, housing, and career services. But we are more than just a nonprofit. Nonprofit really is a, a tax status. It's not a financial situation. In many ways, there's a misnomer that uh, nonprofits operate unlike a business, but in fact, we're very similar in the way that we operate. Uh, we have staffing and marketing and communications and technology and program delivery that are tools to accomplish our mission. Fundraising and meeting budgets are tactics assigned to our effective operational goals and will help us to achieve our mission. In many respects, we do operate like a business. So today I wanna to talk a little bit about the factors that um, SAY considered in making a commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Again, I felt uh, as my duty as a uh, as the first CEO and a woman of color at this organization to um, bring this issue to the forefront for many respects, in many respects. Um, and I was really fortunate in that the organization uh, staff, the board, all embraced uh, making a commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we really began the conversation by first identifying race champions, both at the board and leadership levels. And again, the conversation was born out of the murder of, of George Floyd. And I remember my board president at the time asking me, how are you doing? And I told him, not good. We have to do something. And that's when he challenged me uh, and challenged us all to do our personal work and then do our um, organizational work. And we've been taking that journey ever since. So we created buy-in by having conversations at all levels within the organization, including discussing potential impact on our donors. Uh, we created a diversity, equity, and inclusion statement, which I'll share here in my presentation. We decided to make race equity work as part of our strategic priorities in consultation with um, a diversity expert, Dr. Sharon Washington. And then we continuously continue to broaden our knowledge and open a continuous dialogue by having safe and brave spaces. And I'll talk a little bit about that in my um, presentation today. 
Along the way, we found many opportunities to make changes. But some factors that we considered was making sure that this was a mission, vision, and value fit. And it, and it definitely was within, uh, within a, the fit within the organization was um, within that uh, mission, vision, and value. Uh, stakeholder buy-in was a big piece of that. And once everybody agreed, I really just moved forward with making sure that um, this commitment was more than just a DEI statement. It was really about making real organizational impact. And I think that we, we agreed to that early on, that we didn't want this just to be a sugar high or a one and done. We wanted to make real organizational impact. And we'll talk a little bit about what that looks like today. We out, you know, looked at the costs and the benefits and realized that the benefits of doing this really outweighed the cost. We uh, committed resources to this initiative and we were willing to do the work because uh, we knew it was gonna be a long run and not a, um, not a, a one and done or, or, a, or, a, or a sprint. We knew that this was going to be a marathon. So the first thing that we did is we decided to look within our own demographics to begin the work to see what are the gaps and what are the areas that we need to do to increase our diversity particularly our racial diversity. And the first thing that we did is we looked at our board of directors racial demographics. And uh, you can see here that about um, the majority, 80, almost 89% of our board members are of uh, white or Caucasian. And we knew that this was an area that we wanted to begin. Um, and our analysis showed that, you know, uh, diversifying our board is important to us. And we have put in our strategic priorities uh, recruitment and retention and diversifying board members as a top priority. And why is this important? This is important because we want to reflect the demographics of the community that we serve. Having a diverse board we know can benefit from a variety of life experiences and culture backgrounds. It will also help us in making better governance and decision making. Uh, and, and we know that by having a diverse board, it creates powerful opportunities to deepen organizations' impact, relevance, and advancement of social good. Then the next thing that we did is we took a look at the data and we wanted to make a comparison uh, for race, race and ethnicity to our staff compared to the youth served by our departments. And I know that this um, graph here is a lot. I think the takeaway here is what we found is that the SAY staff demographic roughly maps to the demographics of the youth that we serve within department. And white and Latinx Hispanic are the two most represented groups. We know that we need to better represent um, uh, staff in each of the other categories here. So that was another gap that we identified. So this is just a, um, this is a timeline of our diversity, equity, and inclusion journey. And I'll be talking about bits and pieces of this throughout the presentation. But in June of 2020 is when we decided to create the diversity, equity, and inclusion statement. And that really was our roadmap moving, moving forward to all of the things that were to come in terms of activities and changes. Um, again, we engaged with a diversity expert to have an introduction uh, and also to open up the space for staff and youth to talk about their experiences, their perceptions of racial inequities, either personally or within the organization. Um, this was a risk because once you ask people what they think about something, then you have to do something about it. And we definitely wanted to know. Uh, and uh, we are, I'll show you how we're addressing uh, the things that came out of those safe and brave spaces. And then in consultation with our expert, we engaged in small uh, group learning and self-reflection. We started to read some, some books and we had um, uh, small group uh, learnings and reflections about the book. Uh, we continued with our safe and brave dialogues and we also um, offer training on the history of racism, trauma, and equities to our board in May of 2021. Um, we realized that we had to make multiple touch points within the organization. We continue to do leadership training and reflection, uh, which is an ongoing uh, thing that we're doing uh, to this day. And then um, 
where we're at right now is we are going to launch online training modules to the full SAY staff. Uh, and we will continue to have our safe and brave uh, space discussions on the feedbacks, the themes and the feedback that emerge from the safe and brave spaces. So this is our um, diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, statement. And as a organization, we wanted to uh, make a commitment, first of all, to listen to our youth. We realized that asking feedback is truly a gift. And when we receive that gift, we want to use that to, um, in, uh, to change and to uh, create strategies to help address that. We want and we strive to build an inclusive workplace, strive towards anti-racism, and evaluate our progress along the way. And we realize that this commitment is a long-term endeavor and requires a focus and intent in order to make long-lasting change. And of course, we've committed to do that. Now, I mentioned creating safe and brave spaces. And this was really the opportunity for folks within our organization to really feel safe about talking about their experiences, both, again, personally and within the organization. Uh, and ideally, any organization can create a safe and brave space. Uh, a safe and brave space um, is really an area where people can express and be affirmed without fear of repercussion. And it encourages dialogue. And if we're going to make organizational change, we want to make sure that we um, listen. We listen to the people who are doing the work and we really pay attention to their experiences with love, compassion, and respect without judgment, uh, with an open mind, uh, and in a safe space. And I encourage any organization uh, or business to do this just to really get a feel for where your employees are at. So I mentioned the safe and brave spaces and opening up the dialogue to our young people, uh, our, our staff people, and actually our young people as well. But this, these themes of feedback are really what came out of our safe and brave spaces for our staff members. And there are eight themes that really came out of those conversations. And these are just some examples of that. Uh, and, you know, we decided to uh, for those areas where we have low hanging fruit, for example, in the area of spatial inequity, where uh, many staff provided feedback that administration was segregated and uh, they were kind of away from, from the rest of the staff. One example that we did is we moved offices where administration was really more central to where the other staff were. Uh, in the area of perhaps of inconsistent policies, we were able to look at which policies were inconsistent, and now we're working on creating consistency across the board. Uh, lack of development really kind of showed up in the area of um, training, and so we are uh, making that a strategic priority to really make sure that um, there is opportunities for everyone across the board within the organization. Language underrepresentation was an area where uh, we saw that many, uh, young, many staff members who spoke a second language were kind of pulled in to do additional work without compensation. And we realized that based on feedback, so we were able to provide a bilingual premium uh, as a result of that. So feedback is really important. When you receive feedback, take that as a gift and then um, make sure that you do something about it uh, because staff aren't going to respond uh, when you open up feedback in the future if they don't see real change come out of it. So turning talk into action, what came out of all of our work that we've been doing? Uh, well, one of the things um, that came out of it is that we were able to take a look at, um, in our many work groups, one of the things that came out was that we wanted to look at our calendar to see how we can diversify calendar. And as a result of that, we added Juneteenth and Cesar Chavez Day, day as a holiday, uh, which had not been done in the past. We did the office moves. Uh, we created uh, BIPOC office hours, and BIPOC is an acronym for Black Indigenous People of Color. 
for them as they experience or if they want to have an opportunity to talk anonymously or with the CEO, we've offered, I have offered them office hours specifically for that. So anytime they, they, they have an experience and they want to talk about something that happened to them, they can always provide us feedback either to myself or to through anonymous feedback tool. We recently performed a wage analysis and realized that many of our staff uh, was disproportionate to the market. And we were able to um, reset uh, uh, through a wage uh, survey, uh, a plan for everyone to get up to our um, desired market wage, uh, including a bilingual premium. So that was part of the work that we did as well. Uh, with our work with Dr. Washington, we had a number of resources that she recommended, including books, that we uh, were able to produce a DEI lending library, and that was made available to all staff members. We also included the expectation that diversity, equity, and inclusion be included in our uh, job descriptions so that um, everyone has the expectation when they work at Social Advocates for Youth uh, that diversity, equity, inclusion is a part of our DNA and part of working uh, at this organization. Uh, we're working on leadership recommendations based on uh, the uh, uh, feedback and the report that Dr. Washington is compiling from stakeholder feedback. And then we continue to do advocacy and policy work around working with our youth, working with law enforcement, and finding ways to advocate better for uh, the, the young people that we serve. The logo that you see here is a logo that we also developed. Uh, it was a, um, a contest that we had with our staff and they selected this logo and this is our diversity, equity and inclusion logo that we use here internally. So there were lots of lessons learned. Um, and you know, these are some of the ones that I thought about. But you know, in order for you to commit the work, com uh, begin the work, uh, you have to start somewhere. And that really begins with communicating your commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And it really needs to come from, from the top, right? From your board, from your CEO, from your leadership. Um, if it doesn't come from the top, then it will not trickle through the organization. And then uh, set realistic expectations. Uh, this is, again, not a sprint. This is a marathon. This is a long-term uh, endeavor that you have to be prepared to take on. Uh, and it's not gonna be easy. Uh, it's gonna be uncomfortable. Uh, you're gonna expect uh, some resistance, but you need to stay the course and you need to continuously um, make sure that you're communicating the why behind this initiative. You wanna also make sure that you do your individual work and don't rely on BIPOC folks to teach others. The responsibility rests on all of us. Uh, don't be too quick to claim your victory. Uh, just because you've done some things doesn't mean that you're quite there. Uh, and then um, a way for you to know and measure your progress is really to use data. Uh, and by focusing on data-driven decisions, you could also um, see the progress along the way and communicate that to your board and to your leadership and to your staff. One example for us as um, we talk about focusing on data-driven decisions is as a nonprofit agency addressing youth homelessness, we want to address the issue of equitable housing and sheltering practices using data, data that we've collected. Uh, the data doesn't have to be prescribed or it doesn't have to be done on a grand scale, but it's uh, data that's willing to make changes and updates. And um, as we're looking through for uh, data in um, looking at the way that we um, do equitable practices, we want to make sure that uh, we're exiting youth all fair and consistently, right? And so any business can do that. Any business can look at their data and really use that to, to, to see whether or not uh, your methodologies or the way that, that uh, you capture your data is done consistently. And it also allows you an opportunity to also look at gaps uh, and use that gaps for continuous improvement. It's also important that you can continue to connect framework elements. So for us at Social Advocates for Youth, we are increasing our awareness all of the time. 
Uh, and the building of awareness really leads to capacity building, right? Capacity building in the knowledge and skills of our staff, of our leadership, of our board. This all kind of creates norms. It continues with the communications, with measurements and outcomes that leads to hopefully long-standing actions and changes in processes, strategies, procedures, core competencies, and budgets. And this is um, a continuous process that we strive uh, to do every day. But our work is far from complete. We've grown in our anti-racist discourse and knowledge and just have begun to make substantive changes for the long term. Our next step is to create a scorecard that will measure our DEI progress organizationally, incorporating the eight themes and final recommendations from our consultant. We'll measure these outcomes by looking at uh, confidence engaging in racial discourse, right? We're gonna ask our staff, what's your confidence level? Has it increased? What's your confidence level in naming and interrupting ra racial microaggressions? The ability to identify patterns of institutional bias, knowledge of anti-racism concepts and terminology. There's lots of resources out there for you to use. You can use them as a guide to create, specialize and apply to your organization or business, but you just have to start building from there. I'll just end with, you know, an organization has fully committed, that's fully committed to race equity culture, it becomes, the values become part of your DNA. So it isn't, you know, a special initiative or a task force or a committee or a check, a check the box approach. It's full integration of race equity in every aspect of its operations and programs. And you wanna make sure that you use that DEI lens in every decision that you make, every policy, every process. That's how you're going to learn and grow as an organization. You wanna take a look at your leadership ranks to see, are there people of color there? Are staff, stakeholders, and leaders skilled at talking about race and racism and their implications? Are your programs culturally responsive and explicit about race or racism and race equity? Uh, are you evaluating and disaggregating uh, your data and looking for gaps? Do your expenditures reflect your organizational values and commitment to race equity? And um, is continuous improvement in race equity prioritized in your organization? So these are things for you to consider as you take the journey, but I think it's a it's important to note that you have to begin somewhere uh, and uh, know that it is, again, for the long run. So I'll end there. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions, and I thank you for having me. Nita, thank you so, so much. Boy, I have uh, a vision of you on that time right after Mr. Floyd's murder, trying to make some important decisions about where your organization was going to go and how it was going to do in the aftermath of that. And, Clearly, you have charted a well thought out path that it goes way beyond, you know, a knee jerk sort of reaction into some significant changes for your organization. And as you pointed out in your presentation, a nonprofit does not mean that it's not a business and you're a CEO of a business that's had a big impact in the community. I wanted to ask you a question about um, this is clearly an ambitious project. You started it almost more than a year ago. How, how cause I know that CEOs have one problem pop up on them every day. So you could easily get distracted from the mission and move on to the next problem. How do you as a organization and particularly you as a CEO hope to keep or do keep that momentum going in your organization and keep uh, the progress being made? No, it's an important piece of the work that we do. And as I stated at the end of my presentation, it can't be part of a committee. It has to be part of your everyday agenda. So for me, it's in every conversation I have with my board, in every committee, in every executive and leadership team, at every staff meeting, we're talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And there's also work that happens in between that so that the work continues to be uh, in a continuous part of our everyday conversation. And uh, lastly, before, and thank you again for your time this morning, I wanted to ask about uh, your work in the community and how this work that you're doing internally in your organization with your staff and board helps you in doing the work that you do in the community. What's the payoff there? 
But I think the payoff, part of the work that happens here at the organization, in addition to my personal work, really helps me to be prepared as I uh, am part of three other boards within the community. So adding that diversity, equity, and inclusion lens in other uh, boards that I'm a part of or out in the community, serving our young people and having that lens, it really does enhance the, the, uh, the work that I do and enhances the uh, ability for me to see things uh, through a different lens. Um, and that's really uh, the, the payoff here is that I bring that lens with me and it shows up, it becomes a part of who I am, wherever I am. Well, you've done the, the work clearly. You've put such such a good effort forward in, in moving this ball. I have no doubt that you'll continue to uh, show the progress in the community, but you've also today provided lessons for all of us and how we can uh, look at our own organizations. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Moving on uh, to uh, a different area, in 1988, a group of leaders in the community formed to build a network of professionals, entrepreneurs, business people, individuals, and community leaders, both Hispanic and non-Hispanic, all of whom saw the importance of an Hispanic community and its impact in our area. Out of that came the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce of Sonoma County. Now, albeit sometime later, uh, Jackie, Gonzalez joined the organization. Today, she is vice president of that chamber, bringing her experiences as a Sonoma State University graduate and an account executive with Wine Country Radio to the cause of promoting understanding by the business community of the Latino market. Based on that experience, we look forward to hearing what she has to say today about what works and what doesn't work in that marketplace and being culturally sensitive to the Hispanic community. So let's welcome Jackie. Thank you so much, Anthony, for that introduction. I'm very blessed to be here today to, uh, to share a little bit about the Hispanic community in general and how we were able to help our local business members as well as our community as a whole. So thank you so much. So I'm gonna start off a little bit about our population here in Sonoma County. So 26.3% of our population does identify as Hispanic or Latinx here in Sonoma County. And we're expecting to see that grow year after year. In Sonoma County, the Hispanic and Latinx workforce is heavily concentrated on areas of service work, such as labor and help, constructions and sales related occupations. And this is primarily due to our region here in wine country. We are very agricultural based. Over the last decade, the amount of our Hispanic owned firms have increased rapidly at a national level. And we're very excited to see that here on a local level. In 2012, there were 5,024 Hispanic owned firms in Sonoma County, which was a 24 increase from 24% increase from 2007. Um, one fact that I do want to point out here is that 21% of our Hispanic and Latinx demographic either do not speak English well or not at all. So when you are hoping to reach that Hispanic and Latinx demographic, please be mindful of that. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and switch over to the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. So we were founded in 1988 and we are a nonprofit. We comprise a network of professionals, entrepreneurs, business people, individuals, and community leaders, Hispanic and non-Hispanic, who see the importance of reaching the Hispanic community and its impact on society. Our diverse membership is comprised of small businesses, large industries, nonprofit organizations, area merchants, restaurants, and individuals who promote Hispanic businesses here in Sonoma County. And one of the ways that we do help support and promote our local Hispanic businesses are through our chamber mixers and our grand open ribbon cuttings. Pre-pandemic, we would gather for these chamber mixers by highlighting a certain organization or business. If it was a new restaurant, we were there with a ribbon cutting, they were sharing their delicious food with us, and it was a way for us to mix and mingle as working professionals. Um, as well as highlighting their business and really giving them a great head start as, um, as a way to be successful here in the county. Um, we are also, um, we would also like to promote higher education as well. So every year we do have a annual scholarship gala where we wanna give our high school students the opportunity to receive that higher education as it may not be 
readily accessible to them through financial aid. Um, so yeah. So over my time here on the board, um, we had a pandemic and the pandemic is certainly is still certainly going on. So with our outreach efforts during the pandemic, we realized that we not only needed to support our chamber members, but as well as our non-chamber members during the Hispanic and Latinx community. So a way that we were able to do this was through our consume local campaign. So in that top left-hand corner, you can see a sign that we had made um, with our consume local campaign there, where we went specifically to these businesses had them take a picture and promoted it on our Facebook page. Um, this was also an opportunity for us to physically speak with our business members saying, how can we help you? What equipment do you need from us? What resources do you need in order to stay open or to reopen? With this Go um, Consume Local campaign, we partnered with Latino Alliance in Roner Park, Karina Garcia from Supervisor Gorn's often office, as well as Martha Cruz, who is now the mayor of Cloverdale. And we were out there with our tape measures, marking down six feet spacers to make sure that they had those social distancing protocols, as well as in language um, signs that said, please wear your mask in English and in Spanish. Um, and this was also a way for us to partner with Marco Suarez from the Sonoma County Economic Development Board. One thing that we realized over this pandemic is that there is a huge digital divide with our Hispanic and Latinx businesses, as well as our community in general. It may not be as easy as them to follow a link and print out this signage as it would be for an English speaking business. So here we were able to partner with Marcos and hand deliver this information to them and really, again, have that conversation of how we could help them or how other organizations could help them. Um, something else that we did was provide training workshops to help business owners fully understand the requirements of what was happening. So one thing that we did is providing training workshops to help our business owners fully understand um, what was required to help our customers and keep our employees safe as well. So we partnered with our local chamber members such as Los Gallo Taquerias, as well as Los Mogajetas Bar and Grill, in order to make sure that they were prepared for these ever coming changes. Um, this was a great way to figure out what to do if you do have an employee who is sick and how to help them as well as help your business. Um, during these outreach efforts that we were doing with our businesses, we realized that we needed to change our strategic plan as well. Um, not only are our business members are part of our community. Um, our community is part of our business as well. So in order to help our community move forward, we needed to make sure that they were equipped with masks and hand sanitizers and new information on what to do if they did receive COVID. So we had multiple mask drives that we did in the Roseland community, as well as surrounding neighborhoods with partnerships with Lido de the Futuro, Mecha, as well as great other organizations as well. We received multiple mass donations from the County of Sonoma from North Bay Jobs for Justice. Um, and this was a great way for us to put goodie bags together to also inform the community on what to do if immigration's knocking on your door or how to renew your DACA status. Um, the County of Sonoma also used us as a resource to help spread information to our Hispanic and Latinx businesses as well. So we were knocking on people's doors, putting door hanger flyers in these local communities that were predominantly Hispanic and Latinx. So that again, they had these resources on what to do during this time frame and who to contact. So as vaccines became available, we were given the opportunity to become promotoras through the partnership of the County of Sonoma. So this was a great, great opportunity for local organizations like us to receive our vaccines in order to walk and talk them. So instead of walking into a business and saying, hey, make sure you get your vaccine. Yes, we were doing that as well, but saying, hey, make sure you get your vaccine if you're if you would like to, because it helps our community move forward. It's an extra layer of protection. It's a way that we can help our economy. Um, our board members were also given that opportunity as well. And we were volunteering at vaccine sites. 
And as our stages opened up, um, we were able to partner with the County of Sonoma Tourism in order to give our restaurants the ability to get vaccinated as well. We were seeing our local businesses drive down to Marin County to Lake County in order to get that extra layer of protection. So here we are able to provide our businesses with this resource and help them physically sign up for these vaccines as well. Um, many people don't have access to computers or smartphones. So we were able to, again, give them some sense of comfort with our personal experiences with receiving the vaccine and helping them schedule it on our devices as well. Um, Alma Magallon, our president, helped coordinate our first vaccine site um, with, in the Martin Luther King Jr. Park in Santa Rosa with Rice's Collective, Sutter Health, and all these other great organizations. This was an opportunity for us to physically bring a vaccine site to the community. Um, and this was also an opportunity for that no questions and, um, excuse me. Alma Magallon, our president, helped coordinate the first vaccine site on Martin Luther King Jr. Park in Santa Rosa with Rice's Collective, Sutter Health, and other great organizations. This was a way for us to physically bring our vaccine sites to our community. There was a big digital divide once again with pre-booking your vaccine sites, a lot of miscommunication both in the English and Spanish speaking community. So this was a great way for our community to line up, receive their vaccines free of charge, as well as get their questions answered. Um, we also partnered with the Santa Rosa Fire Department to distribute emergency weather alert radios during these vaccine sites as well. We're all a little too familiar with natural disasters here in Sonoma County. So this was a great way to also spread some emergency information um, on what to do should another fire happen or should a earthquake happen. So what we've learned during the pandemic specifically is that there's no blanket solution for all businesses. One business may be a little bit more digital savvy than others. So making sure that every business has a, a solution to whatever problem they have um, can definitely help. And there is still a large digital divide. We can't always just push a website to a, a restaurant or to a store. Um, and we have to keep this in mind when we are talking about access to grants, um, especially first come first serve grants. Um, we're always there as a resource, the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. So if our businesses have questions, we always prefer for them to reach out to us so that we can help them fill out these grants. But if they don't do it in a timely manner, they miss out on that very well needed money. Um, we also want to stress on the importance of organizations working together towards a collective goal of helping the community, whether that's reaching them for vaccine sites or for information. Um, we want to make sure that that is done in partnership because that's the best way to reach our Hispanic and Latinx community. We also want to encourage our Hispanic and Latinx businesses to voice their opinions to us so that we can advocate for them. We know that some topics are very scary and we're here to help answer those phones and walk people through process processes and really advocate to them when it comes to bigger um, meetings. And we would love to see that corporate businesses, we love seeing that corporate businesses are creating diversity and outreach positions in order to reach the Hispanic and Latinx demographic. Um, and we hope to see this implemented through the county and nationwide, especially bigger corporations like banks. Um, this is a great way to not only physically be able to communicate with this demographic, especially the Spanish speaking um, Hispanic and Latinx demographic, but also as a way to inspire um, high school students or people who are interested in becoming in these corporate positions. And that bilingual representation is very important and needed as well, all the way from secretaries answering phones to CEOs as well. Um, and we also want to share the importance of training workshops during COVID. Um, it was a great way to keep our businesses informed. Um, we also partnered with other Facebook organizations such as Poder de Saber, which had online shows where we were able to go on there and talk with them about new regulations that were changing, as well as some online workshops. However, we do want to create more in-person workshops as well and partner with our chamber members on 
topics such as finances, marketing, HR, and other well-important topics. And really quickly, I wanted to touch base on um, what we're seeing here at my job at Wine Country Radio. So according to the Nielsen Audio, each week radio reaches 96% of Hispanics ages 12 and older who listen on average for 12 hours and 45 minutes each week. Um, radio is a great resource because we're all creatures of habits. We're all driving to work at the exact same time, doing uh, listening to the radio. And um, a lot of our Hispanic workforce, as I mentioned, is in our labor intensive field. So they're continuing to listen while they're picking grapes, while they're out there in the agricultural um, areas, as well as doing construction. And with the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, we used radio as a way to amplify our outreach with our Consume Local campaign. We had messaging specifically through our Exitos and Latino station during the pandemic, targeting our Hispanic businesses, making sure that they were equipped with the necessary resources, reminding them to have markers six feet apart, reminding them to make sure that they had disposable um, silverware and make sure that they were operating at the correct levels of um, the, to make sure that they were operating at the correct level of capacity as well. And a lot of this messaging too was directed towards our community in general for that eat and shop local movement. We wanted to make sure that we were giving our small businesses and restaurants the chance to remain open or to help move our community forward so that we could help open our local economy. And we're realizing here that businesses are pivoting to make sure that they're inclusive with their outreach efforts as well. Um, as I mentioned in the previous slide, there are positions that are being dedicated towards that outreach efforts and people are physically putting money aside to make sure that they are reaching this demographic because it is 26% of our population and they don't want to miss that demographic. We also work with local businesses to create successful marketing campaigns in English and Spanish. And as Anita mentioned previously, people were doing extra work by translating stuff in Spanish and not getting paid on that. So when it comes down to it, we're happy to do that for you here as a way to reach that Hispanic community as well. And we do have a nonprofit matching schedule that can increase your outreach efforts as well. So if a nonprofit like say um, has a message that they would like to share, we do offer that matching schedule on our younger demographic station, Latino. And we're also seeing an increase of recruitment campaigns here with our bilingual candidate emphasis. Um, people are wanting to be inclusive and in order to be inclusive, they wanna make sure that they have that Spanish language um, accessibility within their corporation. And we're also out and about at community events, just like the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce was, promoting and focusing on uplifting our Hispanic and Latinx community, whether that's at the Cinco de Mayo Roseland community event or Mexican Independence Day, or promoting um, safety and awareness with uh, Sonoma Ready Day or the Fire and Earthquake Safety Expo as well. Um, we also have encouraging programs such as Pays for A's where we're encouraging our younger Hispanic and Latinx demographic to do well in school so that they can present us with a report card. And if they have an A on it, then they get tickets to Scandia, Epicenter and some other fun family activities. We also have opportunities with the Krozak Family Foundation where we gave a family in need a car to get around and to, to have that easy accessibility here in Sonoma County. So we are really working to help keep our Hispanic and Latinx community informed, as well as having our CHP officer come in, the County of Sonoma, as well as uplifting our community through these great events. If anybody needs any more information or would like to contact me, I do have some information here about the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, as well as our email, as well as ways to reach me here at Wine Country Radio. Um, Anthony, go ahead and take it away. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Jackie. A really um, helpful presentation and and uh, very boots on the ground kind of thing. I think you, you and the members of the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce have clearly been there for your community during the past year and plus months uh, mm -hmm. dealing with COVID. So I'm gonna ask one question about yeah. that. What's your sense having worked with uh, businesses in the last year and a half 
yourself and then other members of the chamber, how did the Hispanic business community itself fare during the COVID? Is it damaged uh, significantly and is it recovering? I would say it's definitely recovering. Um, we definitely had to, again, pivot our messaging. Um, and as we were asking our businesses to change, um, we noticed that we needed to do that as well. Um, and our businesses really followed that model as well. So they were able to really dig down deep and say, okay, what can I do to protect my business? How can I shift? Can I start accepting card payments? Should I not only just accept cash? Um, I mean, there was plenty of ways that they were um, shifting their focuses um, and we were there able to help them um, and other nonprofits too and other organizations were always there to to be in additional resources as well. That's terrific and again the chamber and yourself doing wonderful work uh, outreach during this uh, interesting time so thanks mm -hmm. again Jackie for being with us this morning. Thank you so much Anthony. Our next feature is going to get right to the point as we cap this morning of insight. Attorney Seja Thaker has been uh, in the business, in the attorney, in the legal business for 17 years. She also has worked more recently as a consultant with uh, personnel perspectives here in the North Bay, helping to uh, guide businesses through the legal and other uh, landmines that is the business of understanding diversity, inclusion, and equity which is so important. And more importantly, she's a guide to how to normalize the conversation around those topics in the workplace. It's her self description of herself as a legal training ninja. And I think she's gonna bring a bag of tools with her today that will help us all understand specific ways we can uh, deal with this issue, especially the words unconscious bias, which is a way of saying that it sneaks into our interactions with our employees and our customers and does such damage. So let's welcome Seja. Thank you so much, Anthony. And what, a, what an honor to be here with all of these wonderful presenters. Uh, the topic that I'm gonna be talking to you about today is one that's near and dear to my heart. Um, and really the question that all business owners should be asking themselves is, where is the unconscious bias in my company and what is the impact that it can possibly have? Um, you know, you, we've heard some of the presenters talk about why diversity is a must have. I think we've gone from, it'd be a nice thing to have to now realizing that it's here. And there's lots of reasons for why diversity is good. McKinsey and company came out with a couple of reports that outlined the business case for diversity, right? Organizations that recognize that they're only as good as their people are going to spend resources and time on making sure that they cast a wide net to get diversity in the door. By doing that, they have a larger access to a pool of candidates and increase their chance of getting the best talent for their organizations. And this applies regardless of the size of your organization. Employers that put their employees first, right, they're going to have an advantage over their competitors. Research shows that they're going to have innovative solutions. They're going to have higher morale. They're going to have an environment where there's psychological safety and trust. They're going to have increased brand reputation, less lawsuits, less turnover. And they're going to be equipped to handle complex problems and serve a broader range of people globally. Right? This last year and a half has shown us that with the globalization, with remote working, and the fact that now people are expected to stay in the workforce longer, which means we're going to have close to five generations working together. So that increases the likelihood of unconscious bias creeping into your workforce. And so again, the question is, where is this unconscious bias in my organization? Because these hidden biases exist in every single organization. And when I talk about diversity, I want us to think about it from a broad perspective. We are all different from each other. We have different lived experiences. We grew up differently, different cultures, different education, different backgrounds, different family, different things that we've been exposed to. So this is going to creep into the organizations as we bring different people into our organizations. 
it could undermine unconscious bias if it's not checked, it can undermine recruitment efforts, employee development, it can, in, in, it can increase lawsuits. I mean, as an attorney, I was expecting to see a lot of cases where people were intentionally trying to harm other people. I mean, the cases I worked on primarily dealt with harassment and discrimination. And to my surprise, what I ran into more was the fact that unconscious bias creeping in resulting in microaggressions or resulting in behavior that individuals who were well-intentioned, who weren't even aware that they were signaling to other people through their behaviors, through their actions, through their words, because of their unconscious bias, they were sending off messages and these behaviors were not checked. And so the behaviors continued and continued and before long, it turned into a complaint or a lawsuit. And so it, this can impact every component of your business. It is important to understand that getting diversity in the door isn't going to solve the problem. And this is where I think a lot of organizations get caught in that trap. We see a lot of companies bringing in diversity, but you also have to keep in mind that when you have people who are different from each other, inherent in that are going to be challenges that are going to be present in every work environment. And unfortunately, there is no one answer to how do we solve the problem of unconscious bias, because the people you have in your organization are different than the organization next door. So you really have to take a look at your own organization, both from a organizational perspective, but also from an individual perspective as you tackle the issues of unconscious bias in your organization. When you put different people in together, it's gonna create challenges. It's gonna, it's gonna result in more stereotypes. It's going to take more effort to reach a consensus. It's going to, when you have different perspectives, which is, we all know there's so many benefits to that, but it can also increase the risk of misunderstandings. And if you don't address these inherent challenges that come along with diversity, it's going to create an increase in misunderstandings, which can quickly turn into conflict, which will quickly turn into lawsuits. So addressing unconscious bias from both an individual perspective as well as an organizational perspective really goes to the health and survival of a lot of organizations. And we saw that happening last year. Lots of organizations started offering unconscious bias trainings and implementing some of the diversity and inclusion strate strategies that we've heard some of the other panelists talk about. But I really want to normalize this conversation with all of us here today because bias, the word bias in and of itself has a negative connotation associated with it. A lot of times as I was doing these workshops and this training, what I recognized that the minute people heard the word bias, they started to disconnect from the conversation. And it's time that we normalize this conversation. If you have a brain, you have bias. It's just the way it is. Our brain processes close to 11 million pieces of information every single second, yet only 50 of that is consciously processed. So if you think about that, we are on autopilot every single day. It's our survival mechanism. When we have all this information coming towards us, our brain is going to categorize all this information at lightning speed. And so before you know it, all of us make judgments about people that are different than us when we meet them. Science shows that within the first seven seconds of meeting someone, you make 11 judgments about that person. This is even before meeting that person or talking to that person. And then you spend the rest of your time looking for evidence to confirm those existing beliefs, whether or not they were true. Now you can see that this can create major problems in our ability to see each other's talents, motivations, and to collaborate and interact with each other, especially in our organizations and outside of our organizations. So it's important to empower your employees with skills so that they can do the work themselves to figure out, and this is a lifelong process, what your own unconscious biases are. 
And so I want to share with you three tools that each one of us can start to implement into our own lives to learn about our own unconscious bias. That's step one. Until you learn about your own hidden biases, and we're all different from each other, and so our biases are going to be all different from each other. And so it's not a bad thing. It's normal. The point is, it's understanding what your own preconceived notions are, what these unconscious biases are, so that you can mitigate the harm that can result. So three tools. One, there is an online tool called the Implicit Association Test. I don't like calling it a test because it's a tool. It's not a pass or fail. We all have these biases. It's really about understanding your natural tendencies or preferences. If we are faced with two different people, because of our lived experiences, we might favor one over the other, right? So this online tool, just go to Dr. Google and type in implicit association test and it'll pull it right up for you. It's free. It's broken down to all these different categories. You answer these questions and it tells you what your natural tendencies are. You will learn so much about yourself. And this information is valuable because especially when you're making important decisions like who to hire, who to promote, who to put on which projects, you want to make sure you're not on autopilot, that you're taking these natural tendencies that you have into consideration, whether they're favorable or not. So for example, I have a nine-year-old son and he's the center of my universe. Now, if I was a hiring manager and two people walked in the door and one looks like my son, I naturally might favor that person. That's just normal. But now when I'm making that decision, I wanna be able to check that bias at the door to say, wait a second, let me make these important decisions based on this individual's skills, their talents, their, their experience, not because they look like my son. So bias could be positive or negative, right? So take the online tool and it's broken down to a lot of different sections. So you don't even have to do it all at once. You could do a little bit at a time and learn more about your own, your hidden biases that you have. A second tool is to start paying attention to whenever you have a strong positive or negative reaction towards somebody. Just start observing your reactions. Because we oftentimes we're on autopilot, we don't really pay attention to how truly subjective our reactions are. And ask yourself whether you're having a, a strong positive reaction or a negative, are there facts to support these assumptions I'm making about that person? Or am I just making this assumption because that's just of my life or what I've gone through? This is how I've always looked at it. And what you'll start seeing is patterns in why you might be leaning in certain directions or against certain people. It's valuable information. And again, it's a lifelong process. But as you do this work, the reason why it's so important is you start to see that a lot of times your unconscious beliefs or biases are actually the opposite of what you currently believe. So when I grew up, I'm Indian, and I grew up in an all-Italian neighborhood. We were the only Indian family in this entire town. So I dealt with harassment and discrimination at a very young age. I mean, that's a lot of the reason why I do this work now is because I don't want other people to have to go through what I went through growing up. But what, these were Italian people that were bullying me as a child. To this day, if I meet someone and they tell me they're Italian, my hands get sweaty, my heartbeat starts to race, and I start feeling really nervous. I have a negative reaction to that person. The reality is the person standing in front of me now has nothing to do with what I went through as a child, yet it still impacts me. I still have a negative bias. This goes against the very grain of what I'm out there advocating for right now, which is diversity and inclusion and equity and justice yet I still have that negative bias towards that person. So it's not something that we're trying to get rid of. It's just understanding what your own unconscious biases are so that you can put simple strategies into place to help you mitigate that harm, right? So that's tool number two. And tool number three 
is very simple. Here's the thing about unconscious bias is that they're unconscious to us, but they come out in our actions, in our behaviors, in our words, in our nonverbal communication to people around us. So ask somebody, somebody that you trust, not the person that's going to tell you what you want to hear. That doesn't really help us. But I'm talking about that person that will be brutally honest with you. Ask them for feedback. Ask them, hey, when I make decisions, do you see bias being a part of that, my solution or the way that I reach my solution? Just be ready for the answer you get. Because people around us pick up on our biases. It comes out. you know. And so ask somebody. Do the work to understand it. These are, those are three tools that each one of us can start doing right now. And it's something that we have to be accountable for, for doing the self-reflection, for doing the learning, because it's going to improve your own lives, your own interaction with people around you. So that's from an individual standpoint. That's where you start. Then on the other side, for organizations, you have to realize that these biases are built into all of your policies, your systems, your processes. So you need to review those policies, those procedures, those systems for bias to address the human propensity that we all have for bias, thought, and action. So go through these different processes whether it's talent recruitment, whether it's employee performance, whether it's employee engagements, whether it's hiring, but identify the risk of bias in each of those processes. Look at what are some of the consequences that could result if we don't address this bias? Who might be adversely impacted? And what opportunities might be lost if we don't address bias? And then rely on a process. This doesn't have to be complicated. I know it seems daunting when you start taking a look at your processes, but it doesn't have to be. All it requires is that you follow objective processes so you make better unbiased decisions, that you lead with curiosity as an organization, intentionally lean in to value the differences that you have within your organization, right? So these are just some simple tools that help you get started. But until you take that first step, until you as an organization, as you as an individual, take that first step to commit to doing the work, and it's not easy work, it is hard work, but this is the perfect time. We are at an inflection point. This is the perfect time to recognize and acknowledge that we have work to do, but that it is doable. I want to be out there doing this work, doing these trainings, advocating for the way that I am, if I didn't believe that it could happen. The good news is there are a lot of great people. You've heard from some of the great people here today talking about all of the wonderful stuff they're doing in our communities. But I will say this, we need to do more. And I urge all of you to do your part in learning your own unconscious bias and then using your tools, your social media, your networks, your connections to raise awareness of how unconscious bias can creep into your organizations, into our lives and impact us from truly getting to belonging, which as far as I'm concerned, when we strip away our belongings, our material possessions, at the end of the day, each and every single one of us, what we all want is to truly belong, to be able to relate to each other so that we can come together collectively and make a difference in this world. Thank you for your time. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have for me, Anthony. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that so much. Um, I have a lot of questions, so I, I, I'll take a little more advantage of your time because we rarely get an expert like this uh, on the, the, the uh, conferences like this. So uh, one is uh, in your years as working as a uh, as it, with pro uh, personnel perspectives and other consulting, is there a moment when you're talking or you can see the light go on in some people's heads when you start talking about unconscious bias, you just realize that something that they do continually, they now understand is, is representation of that? Absolutely. And, you know, that was one of the things that really got me very 
even more passionate about this topic because as I was doing these workshops, like I said, the minute I would say the word bias, people would disconnect. So Anthony, what I started doing in my workshops is I don't even say the word bias. Instead of calling it unconscious bias, I call it unconscious beliefs. And you all of a sudden, people want to learn. They want to understand it. And here's the thing. Neuroscience has come a long way in just the last decade. So we now know that we can retrain our mind. It's like break. I mean, think about it like a bad habit that you have, right? We can break bad habits. It's the same sort of approach is first step is to understand that and acknowledge you have this tendency. But once you do that, you could put simple strategies in place, right? And that's why I actually ended up doing a TEDx talk, because I said, we can't get to true inclusion until everybody understands and realizes they need to be a part of the solution, right? And so it's once you do that work, the initial work of learning, there are simple strategies that you can put into place to mitigate. A lot of it, and I'll just say this is, if you think about unconscious bias and conscious bias, the, really the difference is speed. Our unconscious bias is like a lightning speed, right? It happens automatically. We don't realize it. So we're really just putting strategies into place to slow down our thinking before we react and make sure that, wait a second, this, this unconscious bias is lodged in here from what I went through years ago, and now it's coming out. Is this, am I acting in accordance? with my current beliefs, right? That's really the goal of all of that. Interesting. Let me ask you a question about uh, uh, the um, unconscious bias again. It has to do with, if I if I look at, a, if I'm a business owner, I look at my workforce, and then I look at the community I serve and they're totally out of balance, that my workforce does not reflect the community I serve. Is that, is that an example of unconscious bias? Is Are my policies at work in, working against me to, to serve my community? I think it depends. You know, that is really something that I think lots of organizations are struggling with, and it may or may not be the case. You know, I, I think w the way that I define diversity is broad, and to the way that I look at organizations is that you have diversity within your organization that you need to address. Now, that being said, you do want a representation within the organization, but you can bring representation in but if you're not addressing the unconscious bias that may already be present within your organization, it's not going to work, right? So we see this happening all the time where people are bringing people of color and trying to get diversity in the door and then people are leaving because they haven't addressed the right. issues that are already there within the organization. That's terrific. And one last question. If I have policies that are perhaps have some problems in terms of supporting diversity, equity, and inclusion, Am I better served by putting uh, many people on or looking at those policies within my organization to help identify those problems as opposed to giving it to uh, one committee or even just one executive and say, uh, you write the policies and make sure we're, we're serving the equity and inclusion? I think that policies need to be rewritten for all organizations. They've been too legally compliant, you know, where organizations are drafting policies to meet what the requirements of the law are. But I think we need to make our policies broader. They need to be protective of all employees. You know, right now we identify certain protected classes and those do need protection. But I think that also then sends a message to people that are not in those categories that they're not protected. So I think the policies need to be broader and looked at from the lens of respect in the workplace, from civility in the workplace and apply to every single person there and really clearly communicate to everybody that there are certain behaviors that are not acceptable, you know, and we're going to commit that even if we have difference in perspectives, even if we have different opinions, that we're going to commit that we're going to act civilly, especially during those times where we are dealing with people who are different than us and we're having these situations. And I think we need to really empower employees to be proactive, to not wait till something is illegal before we're addressing that situation, to start with microaggressions, which come from your unconscious bias. It's just that people just don't know. They're not equipped with the skills and the tools of how to interrupt these situations, how to intervene, how to call in that person when this individual is ap acting from a place of unconscious bias, and now they're saying or doing something that is offensive to somebody. Right? These are tricky situations, and that's why training is a huge component of 
how to make sure that everybody gets on the same page about what's expected and what's not, what's not going to be tolerated. Amazing stuff. Amazing stuff. Say, uh, thank you so much. We are all about ele elevating everybody's understanding issue and you've gone such a long way today in helping us do that. So I thank you. Thank you. We also like to, uh, wrap up by thanking the companies that have made this wonderful presentation possible today. Our major sponsor, of course, for this important exchange is Kaiser Permanente, and they've truly been supportive of this cause as a uh, corporate sponsor. We also would, uh, we also would like, I'm sorry, as a major sponsor, we also would like to thank the Trope Group, our corporate sponsor, who has made this event possible today. One last thing before we all uh, go and uh, go on with our days, I would like to point out that the North Bay Business Journal is intent on serving our vibrant business community in the best way possible. And you all have a role in that by pointing out ways that we could do it better. If you have suggestions, please reach out to me, editor and content, event content manager, Anthony Borders, and let me know how we're doing. We really appreciate it. The journal is planning a series of special events and recognitions today. Check out some of them on our website and nominate someone for an awards program as well. Friends, I appreciate you being on the journey with us today. It's been quite an experience. Please have a productive day and thank you.